Hello, everyone, and welcome to our last day of PAC. Before we introduce our speaker today, I just wanted to take this opportunity again to thank everyone so much who's been such a big effort, who's made such a big effort to work with us this weekend. Media services, facilities, dining services, our amazing PAC board, they have done so much for me and for the speakers this weekend. I am so grateful. So thanks again, everyone. And now we'll hear from Sierra about our last speaker. Good morning. So our speaker this morning, Molly King, is a multi-passionate entrepreneur. She currently hosts a podcast called Live Your Dance, serves as the chief content officer of the online brand Girl Meets Strong, writes for several publications, and dances competitively around the world in West Coast Swing. Prior to being self-employed, she spent several years in marketing for Mozo Shoes. But although she was progressing up the corporate ladder, she knew she still had something entirely unique to bring to the marketplace. So she decided to set out on her own and innovate her career. She has since authored two books, the first of which, entitled Don't Settle, launched to great success and is currently available in print as of March 2016. Her upcoming book, Live Your Dance, will be published in the fall of 2016. She now identifies as a writer, dancer, and entrepreneur on a mission to encourage others to live your dance in whatever form that may take. Please join me in welcoming Molly King. Well, good morning. How is everyone? Do you, do you feel like you're drinking from a fire hose this weekend a little bit? Good. Well, thank you so much for having me here, Molly and the board and everyone. It's really a pleasure and a privilege. And um, I'm really grateful I actually made it here because I came from Colorado this week and they've been getting snow upon snow and blizzards. And I actually drove out of a blizzard yesterday morning at around 4 a.m to get here and uh, I parked my car at Wally Park by the airport and all of a sudden I opened my door, I put on my backpack and I stepped outside and I landed flat on my face. <laughs> and I was like, I was thinking about it later and I was like, you know, I feel like I'm really following in Mary Baker Eddy's footsteps right now. <laughs> Just following that whole. Um, but no, I'm, I'm very excited to be here, um, alive and well. And um, this has just been a really wonderful opportunity to pull my thoughts together on this topic of innovation. Um, like Sierra mentioned, I've had several different chapters already in my career post Principia College. And um, I like to think that I'm taking my liberal arts education and just putting it into my life, that I still have a full course load. I have anywhere from four to eight projects going at a time. And it feels like I'm still in school, except I get paid and I get to do it from wherever I want. So it's kind of really awesome. Um, so, oh, goodness, let me do this. OK. Um, I, I just thought this was a fun idea. I was researching innovation and, um, and patents and, and how kind of intellectual property gets created. And I found this quote, or this fact, actually, that in 1899, 117 years ago, uh, there was a man named Charles Duell, who was the commissioner of the US Patent Office. And he made himself famous by resigning from the post office in 1899 and recommending that they close, uh, sorry, the patent office, if I said post office, patent office, he recommended that they close it because everything that had been invented had already been invented. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty funny. The next year out came the assembly line, they had air conditioning shortly after, the teddy bear, convertibles, cars, camera, I mean, obviously everything after that. But pretty soon, I mean, they were still innovating and I thought that was pretty bold of him to say that everything was done. <laughs> so um, what we're gonna talk about today, and I'll get more into patents a little bit later, but this idea of choreographing innovation. I love this thought, um, since I come from a dance background now, this idea that choreographing, which is essentially just composing ideas, bringing inspiration and pulling it together in a visual way. 
So many choreographers, many dancers find inspiration in everything they do or all around them. They see movement, they hear rhythm, they, they're hearing music all the time. And it's, it's a mindset, right? It's a muscle. And as you're becoming more and more innovative, that too is a muscle. That's part of looking around you for problems, for opportunities. I think you've probably heard it said a lot this weekend that if there are problems, those are really just opportunities to find a solution, right? So same thing here. When I talk about choreographing innovation, I'm just talking about creating solutions along the way, composing all these different elements and putting them together in a visual quote unquote dance. <clears throat> I thought about actually, if, if PAC had a BuzzFeed right now, I was thinking if my talk were renamed, it would be something like, for delightful stories that will inspire you to dream big. Um, and so essentially what I'll go over are four different chapters of my career. And after each one, we'll talk about one of the principles that helped me innovate. So I wanted to ask this question. How cool would it be if you could get paid 30K to design your own project and then go do it? Would anyone else want to be in on that? OK, cool. Um, and just for, just for fun, does anyone have any ideas right now of project that they would want to go after? Anyone? I see a hand in the back, maybe? And we can share. I wanted to hear. <coughs> Anyone? No? OK. Well, I had an idea I'll tell you about. Um, several years ago, actually, let's see, two years ago, I had this idea to take my love of writing, because I used to journal, and I still do, all the time. <coughs> take this love of writing and my love of dance and marry them together in a project. And I thought about, I was like, how can I do this? How can I get people? And it wasn't, it wasn't this mentality, but essentially it was, how do I get people to pay me to do what I love? Because I feel like my hypothesis and what I write about in my book is that if you're doing something you love, it's going to have a much bigger, broader effect on the whole, and not just on the community, but on yourself. And instead of having a job that sucks you dry, that you don't enjoy, then you treat other people in ways that you're probably not proud of, and it affects the larger community. And so conversely, <clears throat> if I were doing something I really enjoyed, I figured that would have a beautiful effect on myself and on my community. So I took these ideas that I love to dance, <laughs> I love to write, and my ultimate dream, <clears throat> which seemed very far away at the time, was to dance on the floor of the US Open Swing Dance Championships. So every year, West Coast Swing has a huge event. It brings people from all over the world to California, and right near LA. And it's, it's an event that has several different chapters, I'll call them. Um, and there's a routine section. And so I wanted to find a partner. I didn't have a partner at the time. I wanted to practice a routine and get out there and do what I love to do out on that floor. It's a very prestigious event, um, and it requires a lot of work to be out there. But this was a stretch for me, and I thought, you know what? What if I could pull all these things together and create something that could make this happen? Well, long story short, actually a friend of mine, another Prin grad, if you know Benjamin Dorr, um, he already had had, had had a successful Kickstarter campaign. And he said to me, what if you did a Kickstarter? And so I called him up and I asked him all about it. How did you do it? What were the pitfalls? What didn't work well? What did work well? How did you deal with the stress of putting this project out there? And what if it fails? What if everyone sees you fail? All these things. And he talked me through the whole thing. And he didn't sugarcoat it. And he said, it's going to be hard. And you know, here are the things to look out for. So I took that all in stride. And I thought, you know what? I can do this. My vision ultimately isn't to do this for myself. It was for the community. I wanted to show people that it's possible to figure out a way to do what you love and to fund it so that you're not a penniless person and that you can go create something that then blesses the community. So I started this campaign. It took me about a month to design it. And I had done a lot of marketing in my, my job, cubicle job. And so I took my skills that I had learned over there about camp running campaigns and getting it out there and I used my network to create this campaign. I brought in some friends, we created the video, I created the outline, I had a shot list, I had the whole thing, and I even started with what's my outcome for this whole project. My, pro my whole outcome 
was to figure out a way to bring these ideas together and serve the community and show them that it's possible to do what you love. So while I was in the middle of it, it was so exciting. I had all this energy. I was so pumped. We created this video, and I'll show you a little clip of it. Um, and what I loved about the process was really getting to connect with this idea of what if I could design anything? Like Andres talked about yesterday, why not, right? I have all these ideas. Why not bring them together and see what can happen? I'll play you a little clip here. Yeah, I kind of like dance. <laughs> it happened, I stumbled upon it the New Year's Eve of 2009 to 2010. And since then, it's absolutely changed my life. But I mean, it's also, it's not always easy. I mean, it can be frustrating and disappointing too, just like any other job or anywhere else. But the thing is, I'm committed to this. So that was part of my campaign. The video is much longer. You can find it online. But what I found out throughout this process was that making this video made it real. All of a sudden, it was like I couldn't turn back, right? This was official. It was actually going to happen. And I found there were a few people, actually, who talked to me and told me they didn't want to donate because of this idea that they didn't want to just fund, you know, let me just pay your rent while you go do what you love. It's like. You know, at some point I had to kind of put aside my ego and say, this isn't about me. This is about the vision. This is what I want to create. And so putting that aside, when I had to start making phone calls, when I was emailing over a thousand people about this, it wasn't, it wasn't about me just getting to do this. It was about what is this creating for other people. And I really liked that idea. Um, and it really kept it separate from myself. And I knew at some point I had this kind of realization that if this Kickstarter failed, and it seemed very audacious at the time to ask for, it wasn't quite 30,000, it was about 26,800. And it seemed like a lot of money to ask for. And I realized, you know, if this doesn't happen, I'm gonna be committed to this, to whatever end it takes. If I have to go through Indiegogo, if I have to call up individual people, if I have to work whatever, how many jobs I have to work, this is gonna happen. I'm gonna write these two books, I'm gonna compete, I don't care what it takes. So that, energy, I think, was pivotal to creating the success of the project. Oops, spoiler alert, it happened. Um, and so I was really excited. The downfall <laughs> that came, which actually Ben warned me about, was that at one point, your campaign may plateau. It may, you might get, at the very start, a ton of pledges. You're really excited. There's so much energy. And in the middle of the campaign, mine was 27 days long, at the middle, he said it might go quiet. And don't be alarmed, that's normal, <laughs> but just be aware. And so that's exactly what happened to me. And I did get alarmed. <laughs> and I did get worried. And it was, it was a very trying time. I wasn't, it, a lot of questions came up. Is this worth it? Who am I to do this? Who cares what I'm gonna say? You know, what are all those doubts that came up? And it was so perfect because it really showed me, am I committed to this vision even through all those doubts? Because commitment isn't just when you feel like it, it's I'm doing this no matter what. So thankfully, things started to kind of pick up towards the end. I had one day left. There was about 36 hours, and I still needed $5,600 in that last bit. So 
it was definitely a trying time. I was trying to keep things upbeat, but in the background, I was kind of freaking out. Um, I had one moment actually the night before this picture was taken. Um, I called a practitioner finally. I was like, I need some sanity because I knew the next day I was getting on a plane. I had, I would have five hours left, like this picture says, and my plane ride was four hours long. So there was nothing I could do in those last hours to go out and try to get people to pledge if, if there was something I needed to do. And thankfully she shared this idea with me that this idea, no matter, like I said, no matter how it comes to fruition, it's already complete. And I love that idea that all these ideas from the patent office to you know, anything that we see out there which started as an idea is already complete and it's just coming to manifestation. And so I really worked with that, especially on the plane so that I didn't have freak out moments. Um, and there's also another nugget of advice that I thought was really amazing from a friend of mine. He said, Molly, if your campaign is so fragile that it needs you to push it along, then it's not worth doing. This story has to be standing on its own. It has to have its own legs. And that's when you know it's powerful. And what I love to see in my Facebook before I left on this flight was a lot of support. Um, I even had a friend text me during my flight, which I got when I landed, and she said, I saw that you only had $750 to go, and I started looking at all my accounts, and I figured I would, do the, I would fill the difference if that's what it took. And thankfully, I shouldn't have to do that. But it was really amazing, because as soon as I landed, I was able to get this message. And I was... <laughs> Thanks. It was, it was a beautiful moment. I, <laughs> I actually got in a shuttle. I was heading to a dance event that weekend. And I was so, you know, pumped up. And I had to tell my whole van. I was like, guys, I don't mean to brag, but this just happened. I'm really excited. And, um, and I got to dance that night. And it turned into a really good dance, which was also really fun. Um, but I just, I loved this idea that, you know, bringing all these things together. This is me and my partner at the time, Andy, at the US Open later that year, and bringing this book to fruition, um, which happened just before the US Open, and then it, it's now in print, or these are proof copies. We're still editing, but they're almost there. Um, it has been a really beautiful unfoldment, and the, the growth has continued. The humility has continued to increase as I've brought all of this to the forefront, and it's, I think it's been just an amazing journey to take this idea, the seed of an idea. I remember I was sitting in my friend's living room when I was like, maybe I could do a Kickstarter. And now to be on the other side of it and be like, whoa, it happened. So when I think about the four ridiculously easy steps to innovate um, in a BuzzFeed language, the first one is vision, to have that seed of an idea. And if you think about it, everything that we love in our life, whether it's our iPhone or people that we love, all of them started as an idea. And so when I think about my vision for other upcoming products, I like to think about what's the outcome I want to achieve? What is the ultimate experience I might want to give someone? Or what is the benefit that this will serve for other people? Um, and so bringing all of those together, a lot of ideas kind of coalesce in choreography. I actually recently was told, think about where you want the dance to end. How do you want it to kind of wrap up? What's the message you want to leave behind with this dance? So that's what I want to leave with you on that idea. How do you want this dance, your product, your service, the experience to culminate with your end user? So now, let me actually rewind. Before my Kickstarter, I had a mini lifetime in corporate America. And this is kind of the question that was presented to us. I was working for a footwear company that specialized in the culinary and hospitality industry. So all the shoes had to be slip resistant and comfortable and very functional for those people who are on their feet all day long. It's not an easy job. I have so much respect for that industry now. Um, and since I was in that industry, we thought about it and we were thinking, you know, Nike was doing shoes for athletes, so they talked to Michael Jordan. We're doing shoes for the kitchen. How about we talk to celebrity chefs? How cool would that be? So as 
a pretty young and fresh whippersnapper out of Print College, I was hired for this company. And it started out with four people. <laughs> and we were in Denver at the time until a larger company called Decker's Outdoor Corporation acquired us and they moved us out to Santa Barbara. So Decker's owns companies like UGG, Teva, Subo, uh, Hoka, just, uh, uh, what was the last one I was thinking? Oh, Sanook. And they have a beautiful office now, a huge campus, but it was still pretty small at the time. So when we moved out there, it was, it was still pretty modest. But we had this idea, and we were thinking about it, and chefs are these really raw people. They're usually pretty tatted up, they're artistic, they cuss a lot, they're messy, they yell in the kitchen, all these things, and yet somehow out of all the chaos comes a beautiful dish of food. And they play, I mean, the, just watching them work is incredible. I'm sure if you've watched the Food Network, you've seen it. Um, and so they're so artistic from the head down to the ankle. And then they give them shoes like this. <laughs> and it seemed to be this kind of mix mash of of opportunity and what was actually happening and they weren't taking advantage advantage of it in the market um, some of you even know Mario Batali who's famous for these um, which I think my boss used the word heinous um, so <laughs> it was it was a really awesome opportunity all of a sudden on my plate they said Molly you're in charge of this project you're gonna work with Aaron Sanchez, who's currently on Chopped all the time, Marcus Samuelson, who's also with him, Chris Cosentino, and Kat Cora. These were the four chefs that we were working with. And I was then put in charge of creating design meetings, filming those meetings, creating a lot of opportunities with the media so that we could get some editorial pieces on them as we started to design these shoots. So it was really fun. This was one of my first shoots that I worked on. Um, I was learning, <laughs> like, yeah, go do a shoot with the shoes. Go out to this place. And a lot of it was, I think someone had a meme that was put up. It's like half of being a new person in the workforce is Googling how to do everything. So a lot of it was, how do I find a videographer? How do I do this? Um, and so this was my first shoot. And we had each chef design their first signature shoe. So this was Aaron's. Um, bringing in his Hispanic culture. This one was Chris's. He is famous for using all different types of meat, all the different parts of a cow or a horse or pig or whatever it is. Um, it's called offal, which is kind of the, the meat that falls off of that animal, and he uses all those pieces that are normally not used. So he wanted to put tripe on his shoe, and we did. It actually didn't sell very well. <laughs> Surprisingly, I know. Um, and this is Marcus Samuelson. He was known for being very chic, well-dressed. Um, so he brought kind of more classy to this shoe. This is an EVA molded shoe, similar to Crocs. It's injection molded, so it's waterproof. It, we put in an insole, so it was super comfortable. You could throw them in the dishwasher if you wanted to. It was very functional. Um, and what happened to be our best seller, actually, was this. <laughs> and chefs are also very quirky people. so. We would sell them, they would buy a bacon pair and an egg pair, and then they would usually wear one of each. Um, and it ended up being our bestseller. But what I loved about it was, as I think about dance and these ideas coming together, one of the fun metaphors I was thinking of while I was on a run the other day was, you know, if music is the market, and if your dance is the product, you have to make sure these things match. Right? If I'm listening to classical, it's not going to make sense to do hip hop unless you know, there's a segue later on in the music. But many times people think they're being innovative by just grabbing two different genres and putting them together and thinking, this is new. But if the market's not asking for it, you're not going to have a real place to put these ideas. So what happened, tripe is probably not the best idea for this market. There are not a lot of people who love tripe. Whereas bacon, if you look at how many times bacon is searched for online, it's thousands upon thousands every day. So that is an awesome, like bringing hip hop music and bringing some element of hip hop to it. It was like something they weren't even asking for, but it ended up being a perfect segue for them. Um, so later on, uh, these are some of the design meetings that we had. This was Arrow, and that's me at the back of my head. Um, <laughs> and I was really excited about being in an editorial. 
um, and at, an, at another event. Um, we actually also had the opportunity to work with MasterChef and provide shoes for all the contestants on that show, which was really exciting. And I got to work with um, the people at MasterChef and then also with Bravo, because we worked with Kat Cora, who had her own show. Um, all these things were awesome. And it taught me a lot about the whole process of an idea with the chefs to fruition to actually having these shoes. And then, not only that, but it's kind of like someone once said, it's like having a baby. You have the baby, but then you have to feed it and nurture it and bring it along. And that's where marketing comes in, and that's where taking this idea and taking care of it all the way through to the end user comes along. So I'll play you. This was one of, um, one of the events we did at Zappos.com. We brought in Tony Shea, their CEO, and our CEO, Angel Martinez. And then we paired them up with two of our celebrity chefs and created this duel, more or less. Um, it was really exciting and stressful for me because I planned the entire thing from you know, what ingredients they were going to use to actually getting the venue and getting it set up and having trucks come in to bring the cranes to set up the lights and get live feed to Facebook, all these things. I started drinking coffee. I didn't like coffee, but I started drinking it thinking that this could be like the magic thing. Um, I still don't like coffee, but I, uh, I didn't sleep for a while. And this was kind of the result of it, the, the art direction of bringing all these pieces together. And then we used this content online to syndicate and get more people knowing about the event. So you saw the tripe shoe in there. That was a fun. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was a really fun event. It turned out not to be as vicious as we thought it would be. So we had to make it look that way. Um, it, it's hard to put two people who are actually best friends. The two chefs that we picked are actually best friends. So there was some good trash talk. Um, but it, it was a really fun event regardless. Um, so what I liked about this was that in every venue that we took, it was really figuring out, OK, what is going to be best for the market? How do we take our, this idea and make it better over time? And we kept having design meetings. We kept bringing these ideas together. And we released more and more shoes and found what the market really wanted. Um, one of the things actually I learned was also that shoes go really well with women. And I was working with a team of men selling to men, but there are also a lot of women in hospitality. And so one of the, um, I guess, holes in the market that we didn't see for a long time until close to before I left the company was that women have buying power. They buy a lot more shoes than men do. <laughs> and that was actually a huge hole in our whole plan. Um, and me being the only woman, I probably should have said that, but I didn't even think about it. I was working with men and figuring that out. But what I learned along the way was invaluable to the whole process of innovation. And they did open it up to women. They created more women's shoes as we were going along. And so my second step is attention, having this continuous attention to your product, always looking for that inspiration. It's everywhere. And as you go along, you're also going to ask for feedback. <clears throat> always ask other people, because you're not selling to yourself. You're already sold, most likely, on your idea. But if you ask other people, usually they'll give you some honest feedback of whether it works, whether it doesn't, what's <laughs> going well, what's not. And I like this idea of becoming a professional question asker and listener. And so as you're going along with whatever ideas, whatever job you end up going into, bring these questions to the table. The quality of your product is going to be a direct result of the quality of questions you ask about that product. So what was really amazing about that whole experience at Mozo was that I got everything I thought I wanted. I wanted to work with celebrity, celebrity people. I wanted to go to cool places. I got paid to travel to New York and um, Las Vegas and South Beach, Miami, and do all these amazing events with media. And I lived by the beach and the ocean. 
and I had some awesome content to post on Facebook. Everyone thought I was the coolest and all these things were happening and yet I would go home and be like, oh, I really don't like this. Like I don't feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I feel like anyone could be actually executing this job and I happen to be doing it right now. But at the same time, I, I felt like there was more to me to give, that there was more than the nine to five. And I remember calling my brother at one point and being like, I feel so demeaned having to clock in and out, like, I don't know, like a normal person, whatever that meant at the time for me. But I was, I was just so upset and I just really felt like I have something unique to give and I'm not giving it and that felt like a slow death to me. And that caused me to create what I like to call my personal innovation weekends, where I don't have to go anywhere, but I basically don't do anything social. <laughs> I hermitify myself, as I call it. I become a hermit for the weekend, and I sit down and I really say, okay, where can I edit out things that don't work for me? And that's where I really came across this idea of creating the ideal day. So I sat down and said, okay, if I could do anything all day long, what would I do? I would get up and go work out. I would have a green smoothie afterwards. I'd come back and be offline, just create, just write or dance or whatever it is, create something offline and then, you know, have lunch with friends and then come back and maybe have something that's interactive with other people, you know, coaching or workshops or something there and then, you know, have dinner with my, at that point I didn't have a boyfriend or husband or anything and so I was like, whoever that would be, question mark face, and then I would go dancing at night. That was kind of my perfect day. So I figured out, I'm very far from that right now, working nine to five. I was super stressed, I'd maybe make it to the gym and then come home and I'd have a pile of laundry and be like, well, I'm too tired and go to bed and wake up late because I was too tired and then I wouldn't get my work. And it would just kind of on and on and on. Um, so at that point I realized if I could do one thing to create a perfect day, it would be to actually get up when my alarm went off and to get my workout in before work. So that was my first nugget of inspiration. And this other ideal day with the dancing and the writing and all these things, I was like, you know what? I want to hold that in my thought and I'll get there. And so I did. I ended up deciding to leave that company. I had an offer on the table actually for a six-figure job in LA at the time and I turned that down too and I'll tell you why. I knew that if I continued to follow the seduction of the paycheck, I would ultimately be that girl that kind of, maybe you've seen this in, around the college campus or in with friends where there's someone who's kind of a serial dater and they turn into this person that the other person that they're dating wants them to be and all of a sudden your friend who didn't like gangster rap at all all of a sudden is dating this guy and she loves gangster rap and you're like I don't know if that's you and I didn't want to be that girl who would just hop to job to job and fit the role but not really know who I really am and I saw the paycheck as being this kind of like golden orb that would take me, oh, six figures, that would double my salary. Ooh, I could be that girl, I could be LA. And I knew I was never LA. So I decided to kind of wipe the slate clean. Who am I, what am I about? And so I had this idea after a hike one morning when I was still at my job, this was one of the questions I thought about. And I was like, what if there's more than just getting a lot of free cool Ugg boots? Um, I didn't know if there was, but I was willing to find out. And so I drew this. I went on a hike with a friend. Um, I came home and I was in the shower and I was like, ooh, if I was on a road trip, I could dance. I could volunteer at, uh, at that point I was really into organic farming. And I was like, I could volunteer at organic farms. I could make a recipe book. I could, you know, and the ideas just started flowing. And I remember I like hopped out of the shower. I was still wet. I like wrapped my towel and ran to my bed and I kneeled down and I was drawing this idea that then led me to quit my job. I ended up selling almost all my things. That's my, the door of my apartment um, where I used to live. And I sold all this stuff so that basically all I had left was a bed and a couple things I put in storage and then what I needed in my car and it turned into this trip. So for six months I started in Santa Barbara and I drove all the way down and around and then up the coast and around. Um, and I was dancing along the way. I went to a ton of competitions. I ended up not doing the organic farming because I realized when I got on the road, I had this epiphany actually right around there, which was about a week into my trip. Um, I had quit on this 
story that I'm going to go volunteer at Organic Farms, create a book, all these things. And um, when I got to Arizona, I was like, wait a second. I don't think I actually like organic food. I mean, I do. I do. But not enough to go hang my hat on that as my job. And all of a sudden, I realized I had been cooking all these organic fresh things at, at home because I had been escaping this job that I didn't like. But it wasn't who I really was. It was a compensating factor. And once that came to light, all of a sudden, I was at the beginning of this supposed road trip now not knowing what the heck I was going to do. <laughs> and that was scary in and of itself, to walk into a blank slate. But what I like in that moment was that I realized I could also create whatever I wanted to create. I was back to square one, but I knew more of what I didn't want, and that helped direct me into what I did want. So as I was going, I journaled a ton. I ended up not blogging. I was supposed to be blogging. That's what I told everyone I would be doing. I ended up not doing that because I realized this had to be an internal journey. If I kept putting it out there for other people to see, it would become something that I think they wanted to see versus something that was actually I, what I needed to go through for that point. Um, so this was when my car would explode and I would clean everything. Um, and I realized that I really liked dancing. Um, this was actually a big re re revelation at the time because I didn't, I had a lot of stories about being a dancer wasn't good enough. That it was, you know, someone who's like a waiter all the time. That they're doing something, but it's like not until you get to the real thing. So I figured out, I had a really amazing dinner with a friend, and he basically just asked me, what are all your fears about this title called dancer? So we went through each one of them, and I ended up kind of knocking down each one. And it's not good enough. People don't, you know, all these things. And he's like, but what if it isn't? What if you made it bigger than it is? Um, and that planted the seed for what later became my podcast, which I interview people about dancing and about all other industries. But realizing that who you are doesn't have to be less than good enough was a huge revelation for myself. <laughs> and I loved this idea that no matter where I am, I can innovate in all areas of my life, not just career, but actually the structure of my life. And I can innovate in my relationships, and I can innovate, and really all innovation is, is bringing a new idea to the table, right? So I can do that in any format. And that really kind of broadened my, my mindset. And so that did lead me ultimately to the Kickstarter and to all these other projects. And it started out with this, this process. So this third idea is action, taking action, right? None of this would happen. Like they say, knowledge is power, but execution trumps knowledge every day of the week. Because if you don't do what you say you're going to do, who cares, right? So this idea that taking action on your ideas, constantly improving them, constantly tweaking them to find what's going to be even better. Um, and this idea that taking the step that I could see, I didn't know where my road trip would lead me. I didn't know actually when I signed on to work for the shoe company where that would take me. And so I really, it was kind of like, well, I can see this step, I'll take that step. And then, okay, now I'll go over here because that's available. And in dancing, actually in two-step, I got this idea when I was in a two-step lesson once. Um, two-step is a country dance and the woman typically goes backwards. So she's going this way and the man is leading her. And my, my teacher was saying, if you're flat-footed, if you have equal weight on both legs, I can't lead you, because I'm going to push you, actually, and push you off balance. But if I commit to one foot, then he can work with this foot, and he can place it wherever he wants to. And so this idea that even if I don't know where I'm going, as long as I commit to one step, then God, inspiration, my gut, wherever, that comes from can then be available to take my next step. And as soon as I commit to that step, then my next foot is available. And I loved that idea. So with all these projects, I really don't always know where I'm going. I have the idea, like I said, I have the vision, but I don't necessarily know all the steps that are gonna take me there. And sometimes if I knew that, I might not even start. So it's good that I don't know, <laughs> but it's all part of the process. So one of the things I love too about this is it's okay to make mistakes. This is not a perfect process. 
This is not like the science of innovation. There's an art to it. There's nuances. And it's always going to be changing. And just in dance, if I started dance saying, I'm never going to mess up and I'm going to be a dancer, I don't think that would work very well. And same in business. If you get into business or innovation and say, I'm never going to mess up, I'm only going to have good products, you might not go very far. <laughs> um, and as soon as we can let go of the stress that mistakes are not OK, the sooner you can just get on with making good stuff. If you're going to fail, you're going to fail fast, fail forward, get it going. And as we all know, the best innovators, the best athletes, they've failed more than most of us have even tried. And you've heard that. But to actually do that is another story. So my, my last story here starts in Albuquerque. And my sister can attest to this. I was visiting her right after her first child was born. Um, my niece was still pretty little at the time. And we were driving somewhere. I don't quite remember where, but we were in kind of a hurry. And all of a sudden, my sister and I looked at each other with this look like, do you smell what I'm smelling? And we looked back, and we could tell that she was working on something back there. And um, we decided that you know, as, as much as we needed to get to where we were going, we also needed to take a quick pit stop. So we pulled over into a gas station and pulled over to the curb where there was some grass. She laid out the pad so we could do a diaper change. And I remember watching her change like, like a pro. And, um, and she handed her, she, she found, my sister found the keys and was like, oh, here, Marin, like, look, there's like, you know, they have noise and all these things. So Marin, of course, loved it. And as soon as she got tired of the keys, it was, oh, here are my sunglasses. And all these little things around us that were like, oh, last minute, here, here's something to distract you. And I didn't realize it, but that became the seed of something bigger. So fast forward another year or so, I was in a graphic design class with Dan Kistler. And this was our assignment, to take an existing product and redesign it to make it better. So pretty broad, but I loved his assignments because they were like that. And it allowed you to do whatever you could do. Um, and so I was partnered. Everyone had a partner. I was partnered with a man a guy named Nate Maring, if you know him. He's uh, this tall, blonde, shaggy surfer from California, and just kind of like super chill. And he was like, yeah, let's do it. So we, um, <laughs> we drove to Walgreens, uh, the close one. I forget where it is. And we were kind of just walking around the aisles looking for this product that we were going to redesign and make better. Um, what we found was something, it's not exactly this, but Imagine a soda can that is made out of plastic and inside are baby wipes or just cleaning wipes. And the idea was that you had that soda can in your car and so on the go you could use those wipes. And so we brought that, we bought that can, we brought it back and we were kind of figuring out, okay, how can we make this better? Can we make the wipes come out better? Can we, you know, change, excuse me, the container or, you know, we were pretty much on the external and I thought about it, I was like, wait, what if, and I remembered back to this time with my sister, I was like, what if a baby wipes container could also be functional? So like, what if it were like a toy, but then wipes came out of it so that mom or dad could open the wipe and you know, do what they needed to do, but they could close it and give it to the baby, and the baby could be playing with it while they're getting changed. And then when you're done, if it's small enough, you could just wipe it off you know, for the germaphobe moms who really don't like anything touching anything, you know, and then throw it in your bag and go. And so that became this idea. And I started sketching it out. And later on, it turned into this. This was the 3D rendering that I created for the class. And that got graded. And, and Dan thought it was a really good idea. And I got a good grade. And I was like, oh, that's it. Great. So I kind of checked that off. I did a good job on a project. And I had shown my sister and her husband this idea. And I remember we were on a trip pretty soon after this assignment. And he asked me, Molly, where's my product? I want one of those. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, well, no, it was just an assignment. It's not that big of a deal. He was like, no, I, I want one. <laughs> and so I was like, well, that's great, but I don't have one, so sorry. He's like, wait, isn't your dad a manufacturer? Doesn't he you know, like have a few patents and has done that? And I was like, yeah. He's like, why don't you talk to him? I was like, oh. Right. So <laughs> it turns out my dad was actually at the next table. So I like turned around. And I was like, hey, dad, can I make a patent? And he was like, yeah, send me an email. I was like, great. Um, turns out it's not as easy as that. Um, 
and it took a couple years. Um, but I did send him that email. We did start the process. And soon I had this rendering. And a funny story about this one, actually, I was working with a team in California at the time to get this one done. And I was in Brooks House. I was still a super-ish senior at the time, because I did a couple senior years. Um, and I remember, oh yeah, it was my last quarter. I was sitting on my bed in Brooks in my pajamas. And that day I had done quiet time with my house in the RC's apartment. And then I'd gone to class. And then I'd had another house meeting to plan the Halloween dance and things like that. And so I had to schedule my conference call with this California team in between all those meetings. And when I finally got on the call, they were like, you're a busy woman. And I don't think they knew I was in school. And I was like, yeah, I just had a lot of meetings. <laughs> and I'm like in my pajamas. And I was like, uh-huh, I'm, yep, I'm a businesswoman. Um, but what was fun about that day for me was realizing like I'm in college and yet I'm working on bigger stuff. Like this was not really school related and that was the first time I had really done that. And that kind of set off a light bulb that I love college and I love this experience, but that doesn't confine me to not doing work already. Like these projects can start whenever and wherever you are. This could be, even if I were at a corporate job, I could be working on things like this. So I love that idea that it's not mutually exclusive and you can be working on whatever it is that's coming, along the, uh, coming down the pipeline. So ultimately what I got was a utility patent. There are two different types. There's a design patent, which is a specific design. This is how this works, and I'm going to get this idea patented. And then utility patents are basically on a concept. So I now own this patent on the idea that a, a baby wipe container can also function as a toy. And the beauty of that and the value that that brings to the market is that that can take any form. It's not exclusive to, it has to look like this triangle contraption that I created at first, but it could be a monkey, it could be Pooh, it could be Elmo, or a hippo, or Mickey Mouse, or Elsa or Anna, or Olaf, you know? And as things kind of unfold, that allows a lot of value that I can bring and follow trends and create that dance that fits the music, right? So currently, we created this one, we 3D printed it, and it's built around the smaller can-do wipes so that a baby can actually hold it. Um, it has a two-button release so that mom and dad can open it easily, baby can't. And then it has crinkly ears. It has a kind of a koosh ball, if you remember those, kind of a hair thing on the back and then on the top, and then a mirror on the back. And we're working on licensing it right now. So that's our wiper pal idea that's currently in the works, and that's to be continued. Um, so this last idea here is the motive. And when this whole project came together, what I loved about it was it wasn't me being like, I want to create a project to make a lot of money to then, you know, do all these things. It was really, I see a need and I just want to fulfill that need. If I'm the vessel for this idea to come through and all my job is, is to get it to the next stage so that it can actually come to fruition, then I'm happy to be that vessel. And I know that it could make diaper changing a lot more fun for mom and dad and baby, all of them. And there's, on average, I've done some testing now, there's on average six to eight diaper changes a day, multiply that out, that's a lot of diapers. So that would be a lot more happy times instead of stressful times. Um, so this idea of having the right motive, and I love the idea that right motives give opinions to thought and strengthen freedom to speech and action, that when you are rightly motivated, there there is a way to create solutions for pro problems and to bring that blessing to a lot of people. That's really all this is, is innovating should make our lives better. It should make them easier or more fun or whatever the situation is, that should be where our motive comes from and not money driven. Because ultimately my belief is that money driven only has a certain shelf life and that's not sustainable. But when the greater good is at the forefront of your thought, that brings power to your product and to the entire idea. So just to recap, we have our vision. You start there. You create either an outcome, an experience, or the benefit that you want to offer to your end user. The attention that you give it is going to give it life. That's where you start to ask those questions and see, how can I make this better? How can we make this work well? What can we bring to the audience or to the market that they're asking for, but they don't know how to get it. You know, I love bacon. Why can't I just have it on my shoe? 
You know, like it just represents, like there's some people who are all about bacon and there are not a lot of bacon shoes out there. So it fit the need. Um, tripe, not so much. Um, and then taking that action to actually make things happen, to say, all right, we're gonna take this idea and make it a real thing. How do we do that? Who do we talk to? What factories in China do we have to go to? We switch factories probably four times because of this. How can we make this better? And it ended up, I mean, our company grew four times within the time that I was there. And that was because of the constant question asking and listening and you know, asking the market, what are you really looking for? And everyone said, these shoes are super frumpy. They don't fit me. Kind of like me, like I'm not LA, but I know there's something I am and maybe it is bacon. Um, and then the motive, you know, what are you out there to actually do? How is, you know, I know Andres, we just talked last night, that's why I keep mentioning him, but you know, even if your motive is why not, that's a beautiful reason. That's exploring your potential. And that I think is part of our duties as as humans, as people, is to explore our potential, to kind of go to every corner and say like, what if we did this? What if we could break open the box and try something out here or switch the whole question around? And what if it's not just a wipe container in my car, but something that could be more functional for a lot of people, you know, and start to, to twist those things and find what fits and, and to do it with those good motives. So thank you for listening and I'm excited to see what you guys create. If you could wait for the mic, that would be great. But does anyone have any questions? For the baby wipes, have you thought of going also with a larger size that a larger, older child could play with instead of the small, really small one? Yes, we've thought about a lot of different sizes. Um, ultimately, for the range that we're starting with, it's going to be that kind of toddler zone where they're, they're small enough to still be in diapers, but very wiggly. Um, that stage when they're like in the public bathroom, like trying to roll off the thing. Um, so we want them to be able to hold it and manipulate it. Um, the larger wipes, which are, you know, the long rectangular ones, which are pretty much ubiquitous, um, that tends to create a product that is much bigger and not always uh, easy for them to handle. So already with the small version, moms and dads that we've talked to are wondering if their baby can hold it. So there is for, uh, foresight into, yes, this could be used for you know, different sizes. And then once they're out of the diaper stage, this could be also a different kind of container. It could hold Cheerios. It could hold jewelry and beads and things that they like to play with. Um, but first of all, it was like, OK, let's take the idea we have and let's execute that. And then once that becomes successful, yes, let's expand the line and create a whole new you know, part of the market. So thank you. Yes, there are definitely a lot of ideas stewing in the background. So this is the first one that we're like, if we can get this right, then we have some proven credibility in the market. And then we can build off of that. Anyone else? Other questions? Yeah. I just kind of lost the line in your story. So you took this trip dancing, and then you ended up at the dance contest, and now you're doing this other, this new job? Or uh, <laughs> you took the trip. When, I didn't, when How did it all work? Yeah. <laughs> OK, yeah. so Albuquerque, I was still in college. So while I was in college, I was starting to develop the product. I got the patent in 2010 while I was still working at the corporate job. I was working at the corporate job till 2012 when I quit, and then I started the road trip. And then since that road trip, I've lived in Dallas and LA and Seattle and Colorado, all while doing um, the dancing, the books, the podcast, now the editor-in-chief job, and I also do freelance design. It's like I said, it's a liberal arts life, not just a liberal arts education. So it's ongoing, and most people don't know where I am when I call them, and I don't know where I'm going to live you know, in a few months. But that's part of my lifestyle right now, and everything fits in my car so I can be portable. But that was actually when I left my job, I had two values that I wanted to go after, and they were flexibility and mobility. 
So while I was designing my life, it was around those two values. How can I have flexibility of my schedule so I can go visit friends or go on trips and take advantage of these opportunities, but also be able to be mobile and not have to feel tied down, because I know at some point I will, but at my job I felt very confined and very restricted. So I think that was my way of breaking out and creating something very different for myself, if that made sense. Thanks. Yes. Oh. Um, so you said that you would spend weekends just thinking about what you wanted to do and we wouldn't socialize. Yeah. Um, are there uh, strategies that you use during that time that you could share with us to help figure out what we want to do with our lives? Definitely. Definitely. Um, I actually, conveniently, put it in here. Um, and I called them, in my book, I called them uh, my life editing weekend. And so I have this step-by-step -step process, which I'm looking for right now. Um, and I can find it and show you afterwards, too. Um, but basically, I sit down, and if I'm remembering it right, I sit down and say, OK, this is my weekend. What is my outcome? And in that part, it was I wanted to do a, there was one in particular weekend. I wanted to do a physical clean and a mental clean. So I looked at my room, and I was like, this is a mess. <laughs> and this represents my thought right now. And so I physically cleaned my room. I took out things that didn't serve me, that were um, superfluous, and I got rid of all those things. And then I also journaled, and I asked myself um, a list of questions that I can show you in here. You know, what if I could create anything, what would I create? What would I be doing? What would my life include? And not, and I, I try to, whenever I do these kind of journal exercises, I try not to become so specific that it becomes limiting. Um, you know, with any of my lists, you know, one time I was doing my ideal apartment list, and it was more like, I want bright light, I want character, I want something that's unique, not cookie cutter. You know, things like that that allowed me to then go out and have options, not, I want something with a brick wall and this, 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 you know, which you could find if you really want to, but for me, I, I want to leave these, I tend to want to leave these things more open so I have more opportunity for it to actually happen. So it was, yes, I want to create flexibility and mobility. That's where that came from that weekend. Um, and I wrote out that perfect day. And then I wrote out, what is my current day? And I put them together and I could see they were very different. And I thought, okay, this is where I am, this is where I want to be, what's the middle step? And I would say, okay, my middle step is actually getting up when my alarm goes off. Because that would create a day where I actually get my work in, my workout in, I have a peaceful morning, so I'm already prepared, I can get to the office early, so I'm not in reacting mode all day long, I'm actually proactive, I can come to people and say, I already got this done, here you go, instead of them always asking for me, it from me, and I would get super stressed and kind of get mad at myself and all these things and then kind of snap and like I, it was just a total different thing so as soon as I got up at my alarm it changed my day and then I was able to give more and I had a better experience and then that allowed me to then later on move into my ultimate perfect day which I try to create more often than not if that answers thanks and I think that's all we have time okay. for so please thank, thank Molly one more time thank you Thanks, Molly.